Hey everyone, it's Owen from Rask Finance. Welcome to the fourth lesson of the Value of Everything Value Investing video series, which is a free online course that will help you understand why and how analysts and investors calculate the value of all types of businesses, stocks, assets, and more. Visit us at www.raskfinance.com where you can find this spreadsheet and loads of other educational content and courses. So this is the fourth tutorial and it is all about earnings power value, AKA EPV. Before we get into it, just remember our disclaimer, the information provided in this tutorial is for the purposes of education and not financial advice. Do not rely on anything you see or hear in this tutorial. That's about it. Okay, so where does earnings power value come from? Um, the idea comes from this book here, which is Value Investing um, by Bruce Greenwald. Um, you can see here, you can buy it on Amazon. It's fairly cheap, which is um, a fairly the, the cost of it is quite low. So um, in terms of an investment, um, the ROI from buying a book like this might be quite high. If you think about um, the, say, the, the, the $13 it costs you to get the book and the knowledge that it brings you for the rest of your life, it's a pretty good ROI. That's how I think about it anyway. Um, just a reminder, you can get the spreadsheet from um, our website by clicking on one of these tutorials, depending on which one you're doing, um, and you'll see a download button there. Um, okay, so earnings power value, what is it? Earnings power value assumes a terminal rate of profit at the company's current level, um, adjusted by us. If the company earns more than its fair share, it'll be either competed away by market forces or it has a competitive advantage, i.e. barriers to entry. Okay, so let me just break that down for you. Um, in this formula, um, which you can see here, is just adjusted earnings, which we create, uh, which we arrive at, um, is just one times the, uh, is just multiplied by one divided by the cost of capital. Uh, which we'll dig into in a little while. But basically, we're trying to arrive at a value based on current cash earnings, um, which are sustainable. And sustainable m meaning more reliable. Um, and we assume that the the earnings remain constant, so no growth over time. Okay, so we've, we've gone over the, the formula. Um, basically, it came about as a result of not relying on assumptions and forecasts. Um, so, some of the some of the changes we have to make is probably the the, the, the biggest challenge to this formula but hopefully we're, as we'll go through them you'll find that um, it's 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 actually quite straightforward so here we have the data from the income statement I've just pulled that straight from the annual report um, and here we've got the the part where we'll do a little bit of work this this little miniature spreadsheet here so I've assumed a tax rate which is 30% um, you could assume something different um, Remember, um, it, depending on your where, where you're located, um, you may have different tax um, implications for in Australia for this size business for Woolworths, it's 30%. So we have revenue, we have EBIT or earnings before interest and taxes, which is reported um, by the company. Um, so the first adjustment we make is for special items. Um, remember, if we're valuing a company based on today's sustainable earnings, um, the, the earnings that we are using, this reported figure here from the most recent financial year, may have been affected by special items, um, and they may be one-off. So there might be things like redundancies, factory closures, selling of assets, etc. They may not be repeatable. They're not something that we should be considering. So we take out the effect of that. I've just gone, um, you can see in the formula bar, I've actually gone back and looked at Woolworths um, track record and said, um, there's a few special items in there that we'd want to consider um, and remove the effect of. So I've just taken an average of the last few years and said, Woolworths does have a history of incurring special items, um, but um, we just need to adjust for that um, and take that take that away from the reported figure. It'll make more sense in a moment. Um, and then we have to adjust for any cyclical effects. So if, say if you're valuing a retailer, you might think that consumer confidence is quite low and that it's going to return to a normal level and therefore the Adjusted figures should reflect that that the current earnings actually aren't what they should be or what they will be um, over time. Um, you might say the same thing for a mining company. Maybe um, some type of some type of commodity price is higher or lower than where you think it should be or where its average level is. Um, so um, this little section here is just to add back any R and D, um, and this is important because we are looking at a company based on a sustainable level, no growth. Um, so we're looking for earnings as, at a sustainable level with no growth. So Woolworths doesn't have any R&D, which is what we covered off in one of the previous tutorials. But I've just assumed here, um, just for the sake of the, the tutorial, that we'll say you have a company that had $500 million of annual spend on R&D, 
the average would be 500. And how much of that 500 was attributable to growth? Well, you could say uh, $50 million. But I'm going to get rid of this um, because Woolworths doesn't actually have any R&D department. It is a, it is a um, supermarket business primarily. Um, and it, it, although it, maybe some people might, you know, it might have a small tech department that does things here and there, um, those aren't necessarily, those functions I don't assume would be for growth. They would be just to maintain the business. Um, so pretty much all we're just excluding from this R&D figure, say if you were valuing a company like Apple, you would want to exclude the part that's associated with new products or, or growth, the research and development that's associated with growth. Um, like I said, Woolworths doesn't have that. So I'm just, I just put that in there as an example. I've taken it away. Um, sales general administration. So remember, this is from the previous tutorial where we did the asset valuation that um, basically Woolworths has a big budget when it comes to selling general and admin. I've gone back five years, looked at what it's spent in the past and said, well, um, this is the average $9.7 billion per year, um, but 10% of that would be attributable to growth. And remember, we're not valuing growth. We're only valuing the sustainable earnings, the maintainable earnings. Um, we could say, put that up to 20%. We'd see that this figure jumps. Um, we are, we are adding this back to the level of earnings for obvious reasons, we're not interested in growth. So we're just adding it back. Why don't we pick a middle ground? So say 15%. Now you say $1.4 billion um, and we've added about that back to adjusted EBIT, um, which is a new margin of 5.98%. Then we obviously have to adjust um, for taxes, taxes being paid, um, they're inevitable. Um, so we've taken away the effective tax, which is just there, you can see it in the formula. Um, okay, next, after the tax line, we're adding back depreciation and amortization. Why are we doing that? Well, depreciation and amortization is not a cash charge. Um, what happened in the past to get it to where it is today is not what we're looking at. Remember, we're looking at the earnings power value as of today, the sustainable earnings. Um, so we just add that back, that non-cash item, depreciation, amortization, same thing. Um, then we have um, the maintenance capex. So you'll see here that we're taking, it says less maintenance capex. Um, basically Woolworths um, has spent money this year to maintain its business, um, but it's also spent money based on growth for the future. Remember we're focused only on the maintenance part. So how do we isolate that? Well, we'll have to, we'll have to take away the, the maintenance portion or the, the growth portion. Um, it's the same thing in this case because I've assumed that Woolworths spends 50% of its um, capex on growth. So I've taken that away from the adjusted EBIT figure um, after tax. And why are these two items after tax? Um, it's simply, simply because capex and depreciation and amortization are tax adjusted items on a company's financial statement, meaning they um, affect the taxable position of the company. So we have to do it on like for like terms after tax. Um, so we have income adjusted, we've adjusted for depreciation and amortization, which is a non-cash item. We've adjusted for the growth portion in the maintenance capex, um, in, in the capex expenditure, which I've assumed to be 50%. Um, and that gives us an adjusted income margin of 4.4%. But you can compare that to the uh, reported figure, which is once again just pulled from over here. Uh, we've said that 2.448 billion dollars is the adjusted income figure. So what do we do with that? Well, we bring it across here and we divide it by our cost of capital, um, which is this just here. You can see the formula. So we divide $2.448 billion by, uh, we multiply that rather, um, by one divided by R or just divided by R, um, which you can see here. Um, I've taken the adjusted earnings and multiplied by one divided by C56 which is da, 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 this figure right here. Okay, so for those, um, I suppose, unanointed in the idea of financial theory and the cost of capital, um, basically when you do valuation, you'll come across this thing called WAC, which is the weighted average cost of capital. You can see the calculation there. I'm not gonna go into that because I think it's flawed in some ways. Um, and instead, I'm just gonna rely on this figure here, right here, 6.73%. Well, how do we get to that? Basically, what we're working out is what would it, what would I have to offer a shareholder for them to buy shares in my company? So, do, 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 we'll go back to our relative valuation. 
When we talk about the price earnings ratio, it is simply price divided by earnings. So that gives us a ratio that we can compare with something else. But what it's also telling us is the what would have to offer a shareholder to get them to buy shares. So let's imagine that we have um, a company such as Woolworths here with a price earnings ratio of 16. If we divided one into 16, we would get this figure just below, which I've already calculated, which is in percentage terms, 6.25%. What, that's, what that actually is, is the earnings yield. So um, you might find valuation theory refers to that quite often. It is essentially is, what it is essentially saying is, what earnings would I have to offer for every dollar that someone invested? And it's 6.25%. So for every dollar that someone invests in Woolworths, uh, West Farmers shares here, what they are essentially getting is a 6.25% 6 earnings on their dollar. And that gives us a useful um, yardstick for when we're calculating what it would take for someone to invest in Woolworth shares. We can essentially get its competitors and say that here are the three earnings yields, which if you look down here, is an average of 6.73%. That is effectively the cost, what it would cost us to get someone to invest in Woolworth shares based on the competitors. So we can take that figure back here and use it here. And you'll notice that all these convoluted calculations, no matter what they what they purport to offer, is actually very similar to what that simple calculation, just flipping the price earnings ratios of competitors on its head, is very similar to what the output finally is of the, the weighted average cost of capital. So I'm going to use that figure. Um, and basically that's, um, that's the formula that we've run through. So uh, it is simply the adjusted earnings divided by one plus the cost of capital, one divided by the cost of capital, multiplied, I keep saying divide. It's simply six, um, $2.448 billion divided by 6.73% gives us the earnings power value of the entire company. Divided that by, divide that by the number of shares on issue gives us $28.11. Then what we have to do is we have to subtract total market value of debt and any excess cash. Why do we do this? Well, you remember back from the asset valuation that we did that we subtracted all liabilities, including debt, from the assets to arrive at a valuation. So just to be fair and compare the EPV figure, which we've just calculated to the asset value, we need to subtract the debt as well from this figure, which is just there. With the cash, what we're saying is, remember we're looking for maintainable earnings for this business. So if there's any cash that's in excess of what we would say is um, a necessary or maintainable amount of cash, then we'd have to add that back. So you can see down the bottom here that I've done an excess cash calculation Essentially, I've said um, cash for each of the competitors, sales for each of the competitors, what's the cash to sales ratio, because that might give us an indication of what is normal for a retailer in the supermarket space. Um, the average is 9.22%, and you can see that was skewed heavily by Tesco here. It's got a lot of cash and for the amount of sales it has. So this figure is probably not that reliable. I mean, even if we remove that, we would say that um, the average is 3.66% of sales as cash. Um, but you can see here that Woolworths only has 911, or well, like 910 roughly uh, million dollars to $55 billion of cash, um, which means that um, based on the average, Woolworths should have um, over $5 billion of cash, which I think would be ridiculous. So I'm not gonna make any adjustment at all to the excess cash. Um, but if you did, um, you could simply just run look at what the competitors are doing and assume that's a normal level or if you have some research, done some research or you have some insight into a supermarket business and what the working capital requirements are. So for example, you could say uh, Woolworths only needs 1% of sales and in that sense, um, if Woolworths only, had, only needed 1% of sales as cash, you could say that there's 0.64% uh, of cash that's unnecessary and then you could divide that by the shares and then add it back. That's a long-winded way to say, uh, not too keen on adding back any of the extra cash that Woolworths has. I'm just keeping it simple and putting, getting our final value, which is $28.11 less the total debt per share, $2.34 plus nothing because we're not making any adjustments, is $25.77. So all we have to do now is add that figure back into here, which I've already done. Um, and you can see here how that compares to the asset value and relative valuations. It's slightly higher. Um, and you'll see that I've changed the weightings, so you can do this in your spreadsheets. 
Um, I, it was initially 50-50 between relative valuation and asset valuation. I've just um, said that it's an even split once again. As we move through, we'll adjust these percentages more and more. Um, okay, one important thing is what is this EPV telling us? Um, the EPV of $25.77 is, is greater than the asset valuation. So what we are saying here is effectively that the, the earnings of Woolworths are worth more than the asset valuation, um, the value of Woolworths shares based on the assets alone. So if you just think about that, remembering what we did with the asset valuation in the previous tutorial, um, we essentially said, what do we need to do to build a business that is identical to Woolworths? But what we've found is that based on the earnings adjustments, that it is actually worth more than the valuation that we um, calculated in that previous video. And what this tells us is that Woolworths may have some type of competitive advantage, some type of unique feature about it that gives it the ability to earn more than what a new competitor entering the market would earn. So you can see here that um, the total EPV of the business, I've calculated the EPV up here minus the debt and added back the cash, any excess cash, um, is 30, $33 billion. Um, the asset valuation from the previous tutorial, which is back here, was $23.5 billion. Um, and the sales was, and the sales of Woolworths is $55.6 billion. What this tells us, this final figure down here, is the franchise margin. So we're, we're, we're calculating the difference between the what the EPV valuation told us and the asset valuation told us, and dividing that into units of sales. So 18 cents of every dollar that goes into Woolworths as sales is attributable to the franchise. So 18 cents is attributable to something that's unique about Woolworths, a competitive advantage, a moat, a franchise. These are all very similar words and their definitions vary slightly. Um, so Woolworths has something about it which enables it to earn slightly more than a competitor with this very similar set of assets. And that's an important point because it tells us that there might be something about Woolworths that is worth paying up for. Something that's worth paying more than the asset valuation alone. So in the next tutorial, we'll dig into the value of growth, which relates to this concept that I'm just referring to now. Um, and we'll essentially understand, is there any value in what Woolworths can do in the future? And it's important um, to consider that because obviously it may have some type of competitive advantage. And in a previous tutorial, I mentioned that companies that can grow within their competitive advantage may actually make for very good investments. So um, we'll dig into that more in the next tutorial. Be sure to um, send me a message um, over Twitter at Owen Rask or with the handle at Rask Finance. Um, remember, you can access this spreadsheet on our website um, and you can find a contact form there if you have any questions. Um, if I skipped over some of this a bit quick, um, sorry, I tried to keep it as quickly as possible, as quick as possible. So. Um, just shoot me a message or an email if um, you want to get in touch. Um, and obviously in the next tutorials, we're going to be moving through um, the value of growth, as I just mentioned, dividend discount models and discounted cash flow analysis. So um, stay tuned. Um, be sure to check back on our website um, if you want to stay up to date with the latest valuations. Until next time, I'll see you then.